Good evening. Welcome to Spotlight on the Arts. I'm your host, Karen Stevens. Let me introduce our panel. Ms. Iris Acker, actress, writer, and producer of Spotlight on the Arts. Mr. Bill Hirschman, chief critic for FloridaTheaterOnStage.com. And sitting in for Michael McKeever today is Mr. Andy Rogo, artistic director of Island City Stage. Before we introduce our guest, comedian and playwright, Mr. Steve Solomon, we're going to show you a clip. It was a flight from hell anyway. It was one of those little tiny airlines, like a 20 seater. They didn't sell tickets, they sold chances. <laughs> I knew we were in for it. The minute we sit down, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We would regret to inform you that we have overbooked the flight. If one of you is willing to give up your seat, we'll give you $1,000 and a ticket on the next plane. The captain came out and took the deal. <laughs> So, Steve, um, first a disclaimer to the audience and to our panel. I have been working with Steve, directing his show since 2004. Ooh. I can't believe it's been that long. So, my first question to you, Steve, is a question you asked me when you were interviewing me for the job. And that is, how do you know what's funny? Um, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> that I tell you right, right off the bat. Yeah. How do you know it's funny? You have to take the absurdities. You have to take something, a concept, and you have to make the twist. Now, you know me now, what, 15 years. Mm. When I write, I write and I go, OK, this is funny. I mean, my wife, Jane, she has no clue. She has no sense of humor. <laughs> and she'll go like that. Well, will they laugh? Well, that, will yeah. they laugh? Yeah, <laughs> that was her first big. <laughs> will, they, will, will they make it laugh? I don't know. When I think about all right, I'll give you a perfect example. When you saw me, what'd you say? Look how much weight you lost, right? Mm -hmm. So immediately I'm saying, yeah, I lost 80 pounds. Um, but I wanted to. So immediately I'm saying, uh, what did other people say when you lost all that weight? Then I did the Italian Jewish thing in my head. I said, I, I went over to my Italian family and I said, how you doing? Stevie, you look fantastic. You look great. Man, what'd you lose? I, a million pounds? You look 20 years younger. My Jewish family, they take it the other way. Uh, listen, I know a cancer specialist you can talk to. <laughs> <laughs> the absurdities, the twists, that's what's funny. Let's that's how explain I do it. right at the top here, your Jewish family, your Italian family, because that actually exists. Unfortunately, it's true. What can I do? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the whole idea, but i share it with the audience. Well, it's the title of one of your shows. It's a title right? of three of the oh, shows. Okay. But it got the original show, which Andy directed, and in fact, Andy directed all of it. I never paid you for the third one. Yes. <laughs> yeah, um, my lawyer's calling you. The original show, my mother's Italian, my father's Jewish, and I'm in therapy, has been touring and did two years on Broadway. It was, it's really special. The second show was my mother's Italian, my father's Jewish, and I'm still in therapy. <laughs> and the third show was my mother's Italian, my father's Jewish, and I'm home for the holidays. <laughs> then we did one which is called Cannoli's Like Us and Guilt, and then we did, uh, there's a few of them. But they all were based on the fact that half my family's Italian, half of them are Jewish. And, um, I, and I tell the difference in some of the shows. I say, um, um, when I was growing up, my Italian cousins, they all belonged to a gang, the warlords. My Jewish cousins belonged to a gang, the landlords. <laughs> <laughs> no, what makes that funny? It's, it's the twist. It's, yeah. it's just the, the absurd twist. See, what I, what I find interesting, actually, about is you're talking about your background, is that you didn't start life as a stand-up comic. You had a whole career you know, in the glamorous world of the Long Island public school system. Oh, so man. can you talk about how you went from that to being a comic. I don't want to discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> I was a physics teacher. Wow. Um, I, I, I taught advanced placement physics for many years. And then I decided that I want to get my PhD in administration and be some great superintendent of schools. So I started working on that program at um, CW Post College, Long Island University. And eventually, I realized that this wasn't for me. So I, um, I got my superintendent's license, and I realized I had to get out of here. I had to escape. And I think one of, the, one of the days I realized that it wasn't for me was during, during the year, they would sit down, all the administrators on Long Island would sit down and say, what days could um, various uh, standardized tests be given, like the SATs and the, the Otis Beta tests and, and uh, college exams, because they had to be worked around religious holidays. You know, you couldn't give a test on Easter. You couldn't give it. So all the administrators got together at a place called BOCES, which is a big um, place for the administration, 
And we're sitting in an auditorium, and the superintendent of schools is up there, and he's asking dates. So we had, we had certain administrators who got the Christian holidays and the Muslim holidays. And for some reason, maybe of course my name was Solomon, they gave me the calendar with the Jewish holiday. And one by one, this uptight guy from Minnesota would say, all right, we have, uh, is uh, April 3rd okay for the SATs? And somebody would say, I'm sorry, we have a uh, Christian holiday song. Okay, and then he would come to me, Mr. Solomon, any problems with the Jewish calendar? So I figured I'd get a little loose. So I said, <laughs> sir, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry, we can't have that test on April 3rd because it's the first day of Tuchus. <laughs> <laughs> I waited for a laugh that never came. <laughs> and on the big overhead projector, he writes down, Tuchus, April 3rd. <laughs> now I'm starting to sweat. How the hell do I get out of this? So I'm waiting there for a few minutes, realizing nobody in the audience knows I made a joke. And I said, uh, sir, I'm, I'm sorry to bother you. He said, yeah, Steve. I said, I misread this. Uh, Tuchus comes out early this year. <laughs> Oh, okay, he crosses it out, and I'm going like this. I gotta get out of this move. I gotta get out. That was my motivation. <laughs> and that really isn't a joke. That's a really, a really true story. story. I mean, Did you uh, use? Um, you, you, I'm sure this has been a part of you forever, even while you were teaching. Did you use your um, your talent at communicating to your physics students? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. To yeah. this day, mm -hmm. that they come now when I perform around the country, they come see me. You know. Uh, Mr. Solomon, I just want to tell, I've been telling my, my son about you. And then the kid walks in, and he's 22 years old. And going, no, this isn't right. This can't be. No, you're lying. And, uh, you know. But I had, because I was an experimenter and a lunatic, I would blow up things. And, and the, kid, the, the kids of my students would say, are you the guy that they looked for every time the lights went out in the building? I mean, yeah, that was, that was, I want to go in for that. I wondered I about... Um, I don't know, are you your own business manager, or do you do all your own booking and that there sort of are, thing? There are three people. My manager, Abby Koffler, um, she handles my scheduling and negotiations and stuff like that. I'm with the William Morris Agency. I've been with them 13 years. And my wife, Jane, she pretty much uh, handles the business. She runs the, all the companies and everything like that. Because there's another side beside, to your profession besides writing good material and doing and actually performing it. There's a whole other I'm it's, wondering if there are other people who go, you know, I've always wanted to do that. Bill, it's a business. That's the way it is. And you have to approach it as a business. When Abby is working on, on, on my scheduling, she routes me. So I don't get to a place, you know, I would go 400 miles in two hours. I'm routed just like any other entertainer. And that's how they, they actually can keep me sane. Uh, I was telling everybody uh, last, I think it was two weeks ago, I was performing at the um, Philharmonic Hall in Naples. And the shows sold out, so they added shows. But they don't know the business. So they added a show an hour after the first show. So I did 90 <laughs> minutes on stage. I get off, I sign autographs, I sell books and CDs. And I have to go back on stage for another 90 minutes. Uh -uh. To them, that's great. We packed the house. To me, it's going, <laughs> where are my heart attack pills? I can't do this. <laughs> so that, that's what they do. You're right. It's a business. How but did you meet Andy? I'm sorry, Aris. Yeah. Uh, just real quick. How did you two meet? Same parole officer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I thought he was a student of yours. Uh, Andy, <laughs> Andy was straight man. And, when, when we first started the concept of the show, um, Abby, uh, my manager, we, we, had to, we had to get a director, and we had to speak, because I'm not structured. Jane will say, you know, I'll be sitting down, I'll writing, all of a sudden I'll get up and play the piano for five minutes. Then I decide I need to fix something in the garage, then I'll get back. That's, that's my, my brain. Um, and, and I knew I couldn't structure a show, but I'm a prolific writer. So I would crank out pages and pages every day, and I had no place to put them. Andy was the third director we interviewed. And I fell in love with Andy because he understood the way my brain worked. But Andy could do something that nobody else could do. He would take these tons of obscure comedy bits and create a chronology, create a story. Mm -hmm. And that's what we needed. We needed a storyline. Because the, the, the title, my mother's Italian, my father's Jewish, and I'm in therapy, is a million dollar title. Mm -hmm. Yes. It just doesn't have any substance but behind it. But talking about the business, Steve, why did you have to come up with that title? Why did they tell you to do that? Because I had done other shows and, and I was just doing stand up. I was one of a thousand people doing stand up. And they, they, they created a show called The Man, the Music, and the Meshuggah, which was mm -hmm. the first time we ever did it. 
and it had such a limited potential audience. Outside South Florida and New York and Southern California, who? On Minnesota? I think he's one of them Jew boys. I'm telling you, I could tell. <laughs> and, and so we had to create something that was pretty universal. And that was, uh, that was how it you came You just up. did something. You just did an accent for that. You, you have a knack for accents. What's the trick? There's no trick. I hear it. You in just fact, hear it. In fact, I was in, I was in London. And I was looking for a Chinese restaurant. I was supposed to meet some people in a Chinese restaurant. And, and this guy is looking very, very formal and everything like that. So I stopped him on the street and I asked him. I said, there's a big Chinese restaurant right around here in Piccadilly. He goes, right, the same day, he's coming there, up the street, and you come and you miss something, come on the street. So I like this. That was fantastic. Do it again. I had no clue what he was saying, but I wanted to learn what he was saying. I did. I did accents and voices from the time I was a kid. When I would stay, play hooky from school and stay home, we had truant officers then. Remember, mm -hmm. they would call. Mm -hmm. So I, I took the lead and I called the truant officer in the junior high school. And yeah, yeah. hello. I said, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, Steve can't come to school today. He's sick. And who is this? This is my father. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. But I really made money in the Chinese restaurant. In the summertime, I used to deliver Chinese food. And Andy knows this is a true story. Yeah. I used to deliver Chinese food to the apartment houses. But I learned as a kid that when you push the bell and they would say, who is it? You would say, Chinese delivery. They'd never open the door. <laughs> so they would push the bell. You know, I'd push the bell. Who is it? Long Ting, Dai Wai, Hong Wai. Just a minute. <laughs> and I'd go upstairs, they'd open the door, I said, the guy just left. Here's your food. Well, I've been doing that. He all tortures my life. people at drive throughs <laughs> Yeah, I do. Because I do I either either say I'll pull up a drive through they go, Welcome to Burger King, may I take your order? Yeah, I'll Can you say that again? Sure. two minutes later they're out there going testing. <laughs> Are you the only child? No, uh -oh. except for my sister. <laughs> <laughs> we started. Surely you, you've gotten, have gotten into trouble yeah. uh, as a result of all this, too. The only time I get in trouble is when I fool around with people who can't fool around, like the TSA agents. And I do this. And they have no, you know, if I get pulled over and, um, and they want to pat me down, which is the limits of my sex life. Yeah. Uh, they'll, <laughs> I'll stand there, and the guy's going like this. You mind spreading your legs out when you mind? I'm going to spread my legs, and he's patting me down. And I go like this, a little to the right. <laughs> a little bit to the right. You, you think this is funny? I think it's hysterical. A little to the right. I, I really honestly do that. When Jane and I go back and forth from um, Atlanta, we have a home in Atlanta all the time, I'm always doing something at TSA right at the edge of where they'll put me in prison. And, uh, and I love it. I think uh, life, is, life is a ball. So Steve, talk a little about the really when you first started. So you, you decided to give up school administration, and you, you literally Jane was just kind of managing you. Started in the small comedy clubs. I mean, how did you decide to do it, and how did you get your first act together? I was always writing materials for the local churches, and I was always um, I was always like an MC for the temple and stuff like that. So I had that knack, but I didn't realize how important the business of the business was. I started bumping heads with people in, um, in the comedy clubs. I was 20 years older than anybody in the mm. business. They hated me. <laughs> and no matter what I could do, I couldn't do it. Um, I remember the first time I, I did a comedy club, uh, it was Governor's Comedy Club on Long Island, which was the place on Long Island. And they had these headliners there. And you start out as, a, as an MC. Uh, an MC is, hey, great, thanks so much. Thank you for joining your next act is. That's what you are as an MC. So I introduced the guy who is, his name is the Amazing Jonathan. He had his own theater in, for 17 years in, in Vegas. And I'm backstage and the middle act is on there and I'm sweating like crazy. And Jonathan looks at me and goes like this, five years, maybe six, you'll be fine. I said, no, no, no. He looks at me, he says, five years, maybe six, you'll be fine. I was a wreck, I didn't know what to do. We move ahead five years. I've got a half hour material. Subsequently, 15 years later, I'm opening, I'm headlining in, in uh, Vegas, and I found Jonathan. And I said, I know you don't remember me, but when we were at Governor's 15 years ago, you said to me, five years. It took six. <laughs> and, and that was it. I mean, that's, the reality is you just, 
You get beat up, you try it again. You get beat up, you try it again. But the, the true reality is it's a business. You have a family to support. You can't just go uh, $35 here, $35 here, $35 here. It's a business. And that's what we, we created. I mean, Andy was you know, behind me in every show. One thing, and both of you can probably address this. You mentioned it earlier, but people who haven't seen your show don't realize that this isn't just stand-up, that you are telling a story with a narrative arc and even a development. Can you guys talk a little bit you, about you, that? You're absolutely because right. that makes that makes your work different than someone going, oh, I hear there's a funny guy who's doing stand-up yeah, down at the You're absolutely premise. right. We, we produce theater pieces. Precisely. There's lighting. There's stage stuff. As you saw in the clip, there's a, there's a set. The first set we started touring with, Andy mm -hmm. approved, we had 12 flats, 30 pieces of furniture. <laughs> it was a man. It was a set that I'd used at the Hollywood Playhouse. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, we basically <laughs> took those, that set and used and it. We, and we, re, we added stuff and couches and everything like that. And, <laughs> and we owned a truck that we used to drive around um, uh, the United States with. And they would stay a day ahead, ahead of us. And that was really, it was a big production with, with tracks, with 12 tracks and cues. My parents call me, my sister, the smoker calls me. She is always uh, <laughs> on the phone, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> excuse me, pardon me. And, um, and that's what makes it a theater piece. You know, all the shows are like that. They all take place in some venue, some place like that. And there's a development. There's a story mm -hmm. there. And he creates the story. Yeah. Okay. That's what he does. Because I just, I'll, oh, I'll call him up and I'll say, I wrote this really funny bit about dogs. And he'll say, where are we going to put it? I don't know. That's your job. Figure it out. Well, we have to take something out. Because if it was up to me, this, the shows would be four and a half hours. <laughs> um, I, I've taken um, a couple of classes at uh, improv uh, comedy um, places and done a couple of uh, uh, stand-up uh, routines. And, you know, they, they always tell you that write what you know, that comedy comes, the best comedy comes from personal experience. <clears throat> so obviously that's what works for you because you talk about your life, you talk about what's funny, you expound on that. Um, is there anything, any other tricks um, to writing good comedy? They're not tricks. You have to have the comic gene. You have, it ha I'm telling you, it's a chromosome. Mm -hmm. Because, um, for example, yesterday... Um, we're redoing our website, and Jane's, Jane's heading up that. She's really good at marketing and stuff and communications. But what she wants to do is take little 30-second clips of me buying a car, going here, going shopping. Um, and be, because the way my brain works, I can come up with stuff quickly. I'm really blessed with that. So she'll pull out the iPad or something like that and do a clip. We were at Costco the other day, and I'm telling you, there was a big section with a big display called Laxaclear. <laughs> it was a giant bottle of Laxaclear. I didn't know what it was. Jane says, pick up the bottle, do something. So she <laughs> takes out the camera, and I'm going like this. New Laxaclear. <laughs> for those of you with foggy poopies, Laxaclear will take care of it. I did a whole commercial for Laxaclear. And we have the video of it, and she wants to put them up on the websites and stuff like that. It's just, it's the absurdity, Karen. It's the twist mm -hmm. that makes it funny. Mm -hmm. as, that, as long as I see it, that's the way I see it. From what I hear, it sounds like you cannot mm. teach comedy. You can teach people to structure a joke. Mm -hmm. What makes a joke? Mm -hmm. What makes a joke a joke? What makes something funny? My, when I listen to what my dad would say, my dad is the one who created the line when I said to him, what's important, Pop? What have you learned? And he said, well, son, I'll tell you. Never take a sleeping pill and a laxative at the same time. <laughs> and I, I, I listen, I go like, this is genius. This is, but he says it seriously. <laughs> of and, and when you put a, a serious statement in an absurd situation, that really creates comedy. Can, can, can a comedian watch <clears throat> another comedian and not be analyzing all the time. Most theater people, when they're watching a play, go, you know, I would have mm. directed it this way, or that's a nice bit, I'm going to steal that, as opposed to being able to sit back and just let it happen. Mm. Um, it what does that happen to a comedian when you watch someone on, else? It depends on how insecure they are. If I ever had an opening act, which I haven't had in years, I root for the opening act because I want them to really do well so the audience is up. If I'm insecure, I go, oh, I, I could have said that, or I should have said that, or I don't mm. like this, or I don't like that. And when I started, I realized that there was that kind of tension. I started opening for very famous people. 
and I won't mention their names. They all hate me now. <laughs> and I remember I destroyed the audience, partially because what I do in these venues, like the, the country clubs and stuff like that, is I do 50 voices and characters. Nobody does that on the planet. So the audience is intrigued that I'm doing this character and they're doing that character. I went backstage between shows and this very famous person said to me, you know, I, if you don't mind, leave out that stuff about your dad uh, using the restroom. It's a little too close to my material. What he was really saying was it was too funny. Too funny. Mm. And, I, and I need it. And so I just, I, you know, I can't do this. I'll do my own. You know, one of the things I learned when I started working with Steve, because I'd never worked with a, a comic, and that how technical it really is. And I watch comedians now very differently because you can see the timing when it looks like they're just pausing or giggling, you know, uh, at something at something else, that it's all planned out and all the timing of it all is so important. And even how the, the jokes get structured, how the lead-ins to the punchline, and then, and it's actually helped me in when I'm analyzing plays more because you see what good comic writing is, and that just the placement of certain words is important. But don't um, you have to be somewhat flexible because tonight's audience is drunk as a lord. Uh, uh, tomorrow's audience uh, just got off work a half an hour ago. Bill, that's a good point, but that doesn't happen in theater. It, you really don't get drunks. At, at performing arts centers like Kravis and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, it doesn't happen. When I play Caesar's Palace, the first 10 rows are the high rollers. And they walk in there with beer <coughs> bottles in their hand, and you never know what to expect. <laughs> and um, I can't tell you some of the comments. I've done, been in the middle of the show, and a guy goes, this guy's really good. I'm telling you he's one of the best. <laughs> and he's standing up with a beer bottle. like, And security won't touch him because he just dumped $50,000 on the table. So you have to be able to figure out how to handle it. Mm -hmm. And what I do is I just break character. I go into my comedy club training. I say something that destroys him. And I remind him that I've got the microphone. And I've got 20 years behind me. You don't. <laughs> And he goes, all right, fine, let's just sit down. Let's just... <laughs> and the interesting thing, too, is that it's not, the actual joke doesn't change. The order that he does things in might change. Uh -huh. You know, and he can stop and pick up, but the, when you get into the actual joke, the story, that, that rarely changes. Mm. But that's knowing your material, yeah, too. Yeah, and, and it's know. confidence in the material. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the only thing Andy would do sometimes, he, was, he would say, um, all right, we're taking this paragraph and we're putting it from page 47 <laughs> to page 4. And I, I go like this, you know, my brain is bleeding. I can't do this. And then I have to, I have to try to remember it. And that sometimes throws me off a little bit. But mm -hmm. I know what he's thinking, and he's mm -hmm. thinking the chronology is better this way. Mm -hmm. So that's what we well, do. Do you have way. an idol, though? Is there one comedian out there or one good comedy actor that you would say as, as, uh, as a comedian yourself? Yeah, Jonathan Winters, may he rest in peace. Oh, yeah. No Look question. Look at all no sigh. No, no. I, spent, I spent years trying to do his arrow. He used to go like this. <laughs> and I was, oh, I want to get that arrow. I got to get that arrow. And uh, I, uh, I, he, was, he was just, mm -hmm. because he was just, what they would do on the, on the talk shows is they would hand him a prop and say, go for it. Yeah, yeah. Now, you yeah. and I all know it was well rehearsed. <laughs> yeah. But the audience was convinced that he was just shooting from uh, the hip, and that was. Uh, yeah. But I think if you could, you could, you could shoot, shoot, shoot from the hip, or however you just you put can, it. You can. That you could. You can. You can. Well, like he says, he, he can think of things on the spot. So, you know, he's mm. one of those people who are gifted that way. Before we go, I just wanted to ask you. Um, the couple of times that I have done stand-up and, and, and it went very well, it, I didn't think anything could eclipse the feeling that I get being on stage mm -hmm. as an actor, but that's one of the highest highs that I've ever experienced. How does it feel for you after su a successful show? We've got about 7,000 performances under our belt now, and when the audience is standing and cheering, I get goosebumps. Yeah. No matter what, I get goosebumps. And it was a, Last year, we sold out at Kravis in the main room in Dreyfus, 2,500 people cheering, mostly seniors, so they weren't standing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and they weren't going to the Well, garage. the truth with that group is laugh or breathe, <laughs> but they, they were just, it was, it's really exciting. It's, it's, it's motivating, and it, it makes you look forward to the next performance. Mm -hmm. If there are any aspiring um, 
um, comic uh, or comic writers out there, what would you tell them? Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Is there a website that we can access to? Yeah, we're working on it right now. Jane's just finishing it off. It's uh, um, Steve Solomon Comedy. Dot com, and uh, it'll be up uh, and running again. We just we're redoing it because we have so much new material. Mm -hmm. So AP it's, Physics is out. That's pretty much. I don't want to do AP done. Physics anymore. That's <laughs> done. <good. laughs> yeah. Thank you for being with no, us. Thank Steve. you, Karen. It's very. And thank you, Andy. Yeah, very thank funny. You, Iris very and enlightening. Yes. And thank you for joining us here at Spotlight on the Arts. If you'd like to know what's going on in the South Florida Theater, go to floridatheateronstage.com. And please remember to join us here next week when we'll have another interesting guest and our great panel. See you next week.